Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest right now via satellite, undisclosed location. We have Oscar El Blue Ramirez. ¿Qué onda, compadre? Muchísimo gusto. How's everybody doing? You know, God bless you uh, and uh, God bless all your beautiful audience. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Thank you, sir. Uh, can't wait to dive into this. So you just <clears throat> got back. You just got back from southern Mexico, like in the jungle, walking, marching, hiking with the caravans. You witnessed a bunch of stuff. So uh, hopefully you got some rest, man, because you were out there for two weeks straight, right? Yes. And uh, and we're going back again. Uh, we have done uh, seven trips uh, to the south border of Mexico. Uh, this is our fourth caravan that we have walked. Uh, and I believe that this was the one that it was more uh, dramatic, uh, more um, hurtful in terms to see how many children they are suffering and how the, and the journey that they put them through and all the travesties that they are in the caravan. A lot of things are happening, Chingo Bling. Like it's this, it's a whole world inside of a massive group of people. And it's just unbelievable what you see. So uh, back in the day when, um, before I understood everything about the repercussions of wide open borders, you know, I was Mr. They can't deport us all because I felt that, you know, brown people were being scapegoated. And, you know, I thought people were being mean and this country's built on immigrants and this is stolen land and no human is illegal and this and that. But you saw firsthand, um, the repercussions of basically this administration and these and these policies inviting everybody. Um, so some kids were getting sick. Can you tell us a little bit of, about the size of the caravan, um, what you saw, wh how many men, how many women, how many kids? Yeah, you know, the feeling that you had, it's exactly the feeling that I had until I started seeing it on my end, on Mexico's end, because I live in Mexico, in Tijuana, Mexico. So the first hit that we got was 6,000, 15,000 uh, migrants in 2015. Then after that, the aggressive caravans started coming. So everything that it was put and labeled on, you know, there, there's a door, there's a legal way to do it. I took it as, you know, as every Mexican should, uh, took it like, hey, you know what, you're prohibiting us from going over there. But after we started seeing everything, how it was developing, we started understanding that there's a pathway to do things. And there is a reason why there was a wall put. There's a reason why there's a process to enter the United States of America. And there's a reason why they were doing this. And it is just all of this that is happening right now. It is just horrible. You see a lot of child trafficking, a lot of human smuggling, a lot of drug trafficking. You see all these mareros that are MS-13s that they're infiltrated. You see also people from the Middle East, they're infiltrated in the caravans. And to your question, how many kids uh, in this last caravan that they were at, this caravan started at 2,000. Mm -hmm. It started on a Saturday, 2,000. It started walking. As the caravan started coming and growing and growing, you had the quantity on the third municipal, uh, the third municipal city of the state of Chiapas, we were around 5,000. And then it grew to 6,000 in Mapastepec, that it was the largest uh, number. Between two to 2,200 kids that were in the caravan, more than 1,200 women, more than 60 pregnant women, and more than 50 unaccompanied minors. That's the census that the leader of the caravan, Luis Villagran, <clears throat> was doing at every rest stop, uh, continuously doing at every rest stop. And to your other question, uh, yes, a lot of children were sick. It's inimaginable to see... You know, I, I have been in a couple of caravans and when you're talking to all the journalists over there and when you're walking with them, they tell you, be sure to have a cold hearted, uh, you know, heart because you cannot break when you're watching that. Mm. And my last trip, I remember this and it's never going to go away from my mind. There was a detention of a woman, of a migrant, that it was being separated from her kid because that is the process when you're migrating irregularly through a road in Mexico. They need to process that and then they get them back together. Uh, they were separated. Who, but the who, child was, who was separating them? Uh, the border agents, the okay. border agents of Mexico. Okay. And the, the mother was fighting off on the floor and it was raining and fighting off the border agent. But her child, her two-year-old child, was fighting off the agent also. He was hitting the agent. 
So for me, that was like, wow, the, 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 the intention and also that, that emotion and that feeling that you get when you're a child to defend your mother since you are two years old mm. was pretty dramatic for me. And it broke me down. Mm. And also you see all these, this abuse that is, that is child abuse to put the kids, your kids through this journey. It's just horrible. This is really horrible. And they got sick on this part that is called Madre Vieja. That is the most dangerous journey for a migrant. Uh, they put them to walk. It was a mistake. Uh, everybody knew that it was going to rain. I don't know if they, the leader did it on purpose or not, but everybody knew it's going to rain. And, so this, don't was, walk. and this was jungle terrain, correct? Yes. This is, this is in the middle of the jungle, but they put a road in the middle of it. So it's a really like a steam high heel. And as you're walking, you're getting extremely tired, humidity, thunderstorm. Uh, there's snakes on the road. There's tarantulas on the road. There's no electricity. There's no light. So it is scary for, a, imagine a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old that is walking on the thunderstorm on the shoulders of your parent. It's just abuse. It's a lot of child abuse that I saw. And it was raining really hard. It rained for like 30 to 45 minutes. Everybody got wet. When they arrived to the other town, that is Mapastepec, that is a long road. Imagine walking at this kind of juncture for possibly three to four hours and late in the, in the night in the jungle. And you arrive to the next city on the next day. It was everybody was sick. Everybody was sick. The kids I saw on this trip, there was two dramatic and stop me if I'm talking too much. No, you're good. Up. You're good. Uh, I saw two dramatic things on this trip. The first one was uh, on this particular town that we arrived. It's called Wixla. They always stay on a on a basketball court that has a roof. You know those little open you know basketball courts that have a roof, and it had a podium like they used to do like mm -hmm. events right there in that little town. On the podium, just uh, minutes away from when their caravan arrived, a non-migrant, a citizen from uh, from this town died of uh, alcohol intoxication and there was a dead body on top of this podium and you see all the caravan laying down and you see kids playing steps away from the dead body like everything is normal Oof. watching that and you're you're shocked like where is the mexican authorities right here to pick up the body and where is the parents to tell them hey you know what there's a dead body over there you know <laughs> don't go over there but it's the level of education of these people that, that all, all of that, they consider it normal. What we consider that is not normal, for them, they consider it normal. The other shocking thing was the aftermath, as I was explaining to you, that they got really sick. There was a child, eight years old. We arrived to this park, Mapasepec, the day after, and we knew that a lot of people were gonna be sick. And eventually it was, uh, a child was dehydrated, almost dying on the floor, and we got people blowing her air with with t-shirts uh and we had a drone a guy had a drone on the top and you know they had sprinters so it was going fast and they had it on a low uh on mm. the low space for her to just get air to her uh so she can breathe she her gums were bleeding uh, she, she was bleeding from her nose she was dying right there and we were watching that the parent was right there standing. Mm, mm, mm. And, and and you asked him this question because I was not alive when I was asking him this question. I asked him, why? Why you do this? Why you put your child through this kind of circumstance and situations? You knew that this was going to happen. Why? There's no other way. He says, no, there is ways. Mm. Do it correctly. Mm. There's ways. In a caravan, it is incorrect. You're putting yourself through confrontations with the National Guard, confrontations with the border agents, horrible journey through climate conditions. Why are you doing this? And the child was dehydrated. A lot of people were telling us, why, did you, why don't you give her water? The child was throwing up everything that she mm. could. She was in that state Oof. now. She can barely breathe. So the leader of the caravan came over because he's the only one as a journalist uh, for people to understand in Mexico, we cannot give them a ride. We cannot assist them. We cannot help them. If we do that, we'll be arrested or detained by the authorities. It is crazy. So if you see 
a child like that laying on the floor. I know that I'm I'm stand for legal migration, and I and I I don't agree with the caravans, but I'm a human myself. So I, if I see a child die, and inevitably I'm going to try to help them. So it was really something that it was uh, out of my hands, and I was standing there watching a child die. And they pick her up, the leader of the caravan pick her up, and they took her to a hospital. Later on, she survived. But the most crazy thing that I'm about to tell you, Chingo, is that late at night, we went back and we saw the parent. And we did like, hey, how you, how's your daughter doing? She's like, oh, she's uh, doing better. She can talk now. Uh, she cannot stand, but she can talk. Uh, she can eat a little bit. I'm like, well, we, we imagine that you're going back. No, no, no. I'm continuing in the caravan. So that is the kind of child abuse that I have dedicated myself for four years to expose these caravans of the child abuse that exists, the child abuse that exists in the borders and the enormous, you know, abuse towards children that exists in these mass migrations of Chingo Blink. It is just, you will be amazed of how these kids are being abused. They're, they don't know. They don't know what they're up against. They think that they're going to Disneyland. They mm. think that they're going to a, a party. They think, you know, let me just, before I, before I, before I, you know, I, I tell you something. Let me tell you something else. One more experience that I saw, and this is towards the children because that is the thing that really gets me. I was in Arizona. This is outside of the caravans, but just to tell you how much the abuse to our children is. I was in Arizona and, and an open gap in Yuma. And there was, we went to the United States and the Mexico side, so we can expose that. The, the cartel was on the other side operating at a dip. This is like a small dip. And they used to, like, they get the people, they just drop them off, and they cross. So I saw one particular case. It was a late 40s mother, the early, late, late 30s, a mother with a child like six, seven years old. They dropped her off, and the child was wearing a balloon. It was carrying a balloon. So I, I, it was out of curiosity why he's carrying a balloon. She's coming down. As she walks to the Border Patrol, she delivers herself as, a, as an asylum a case. And I go there to listen to the child of what he was saying to her mom. And the child tells, tells her mom, is, is, here, is, is it here where the party is going to be at, mom? Mm. So you're like, wow. <clears throat> Look at how they use them. They use them like that's abuse. And that's exactly the abuse that I saw on the caravans on all these children. Well, I don't know the name of the law or the policy, but to my knowledge, there's something with this administration's policies where if you are accompanied with a six-year-old or younger, mm -hmm. then you get like a higher priority. Um, are you familiar with that? Yes. That's why we have been, I have been attacked really bad, you know, uh, since I found out about that. Uh, you know that I, I can, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the organized crime in Mexico, because I know where at the level that I can expose and the level that I cannot, you know, as a Mexican, mm -hmm. but I have been more attacked by liberals mm. <laughs> and by NGOs than by my own people. And this tells you why, because in 2018, I found out an organization of lawyers that is working in Tijuana that made a fake marriage and they do a fake marriage. And I have the statement from the immigrant photographs, documentation, and ultimately, also, I have the lawyer himself on a video saying it was not a fake marriage. It was a matrimony. And we, it was not a fake marriage. It was a ceremony. And we stopped doing it on video, on camera. Mm. So I started exposing these people because between the ages of 9 and 12, you have a better possibility to obtain the political asylum due to the American immigration law loopholes that they have. So if you're carrying a child between 9 and 12, you have a better opportunity to obtain the political asylum. So this is why you have, you know, my partner, Anthony Aguero, he's exposing on Texas. You have all these men that are arriving with kids. And also over here, you have a lot of children. So, but the thing is over here, you start creating a family. You say, hey, Juan, this is your, this is your wife, Maria, and this is little Eric. So this is the family, all right? So this is your argument when you arrive. So those are the fake families. On 2018, the Department of Homeland Security released a statement. 5,800 fake families were registered. And on 2019, 4,800 fake families were registered. These fake families are continuing. 
This is why the ACLU stopped Donald Trump from putting biometrics at the border. Mm. Obvious that you want biometrics at every, if you got this massive influx of children, why don't you want biometrics to be done to recognize if that child is yours or not? If that parent is his or not, if that uncle or aunt that they are making believe the agent, oh, he's my child, but that is an aunt, that is an uncle and an aunt that are renting this child, that are taking this child as an advantage to get to the United States. It is a reality. They're using a lot of the kids for this particular purpose. And not only that, a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old in Central America has the mindset of a 25-year-old in, in the United States. They know what they are doing. And Arizona Sheriff Wilmot, as I did an interview with him in Yuma, he told me that the record-breaking child that has been recycled is in Yuma. 17 times mm. a child was recycled in Yuma and between the age of 16 and 17. 17 times. So they know the system. Like they, they're renting and, them to, to, to be able to exploit the loopholes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's so sad that you, that you think the United States of America, the greatest country that exists in the world, the most capitalist country that exists in the world, that you have that idea but it has the most weakest laws in terms of immigration. And a lot of people say, no, 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 no. Immigration, is, is, they're, not, they're not weak, they're really strong. The only process that is strong is because it takes a long time for you to get to the United States. Other than that, take that away and see how they're exploding immigration right now. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting is that um, the average American, you know, the normie, the, especially someone who just watches CNN and MSNBC all day, you know, this picture of, you know, Donald Trump and his cabinet, you know, Stephen Miller, you know, these are Nazis and they have concentration camps with children and they're ripping the babies out of the arms. Like there was this whole narrative about separating families. But what people don't know is, no, nah, man, they're renting these kids. You got these fake marriages, you know, these, um, what is it, NGOs and these lawyers are finding loopholes and they, they're fighting the biometrics, you know. People don't know that. It's like, no, man, they're trying to see if this pelado fulano de tal is actually related to this little bitty baby. And but the media spins it as this heartless Nazi Hitler orange man bad ripping the children. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, Oscar, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Like, what, what is, in your opinion, the incentive for the ACLU or people, you know, the, the liberal section of the, of the world or the country that's attacking you? What's their incentive to fight those things? Other than the obvious, maybe votes or money, but in your words, like, what do you think the incentive is? The open border. You have the globalist compact of immigration. The root of the problem is that the globalist compact of immigration, it is put by the United Nations. All these organizations, they're linked to the United Nations, all of them. Then they go under the wing of the humanitarian rights wing. There's a lot of trafficking. There's a lot of money involved. That you're talking about the multi most most one of the most lucrative businesses right now around the world is a refugee and asylum. So you are not going to stop that. It is a humongous business. So let me tell you something. So you have 4.8 billion that Joe Biden wanted to give out to Central America. Why Joe Biden changed the strategy of what Donald Trump wanted to do? Donald Trump, when he tariffed the threat on Mexico, he said. I will give out $4 billion to Central America. I will sign the agreement all the way to the bottom, it says. I'll sign the agreement. But I will send a task force for every dollar that I send to Central America. If I'm sending $1 billion for security, I will send a task force to make myself sure that that $1 billion is being spent on security, infrastructure, jobs, security, everything. In exchange to what Joe Biden is doing, he is sending $4.8 billion to the NGOs. Mm. So this is... It's like funnel, laundering. Yeah, laundering. Money. Mm -hmm. That's funneling the money. And all these NGOs, the ACLU is one of them. So you're not going to stop their pockets. You're hitting them in the pockets. Remember, you want to hit somebody, hit them in the pockets. And when you hit them in the pockets, they will start barking. The ACLU, when they started putting these little you know, obstacles on them, like biometrics you know, stay in Mexico policy. Hey, you're violating humanitarian rights. What are you doing? No, we're going to put a lawsuit on you. 
why they didn't put a lawsuit, a straight lawsuit, when it was Barack Obama? Barack Obama was the one that brought this globalist compact of immigration into the West Hemisphere. He deported more Mexicans in history. He's a deporter in chief, more than five, bi- five million Latinos and Mexicans. He, did, he returned back more unaccompanied minors in history, more than 90,000 in 2015. He built the cages and there's evidence of that. There were no lawsuits right there because nobody knew about these open loopholes, how they were abusing them on that particular time. The next administration came over and everybody said, oh my God, he's such a racist, he's such a misogynist, he's such a fascist because he's exposing with us and he wants biometrics, you're violating the, the humanitarian law, the humanitarian right of the parent. If he doesn't want to, wait a minute, he's not even the parent. Mm-hmm. That's the number one problem, the funneling of money. It's a lot of money. So since we're on the subject of Donald Trump and, and all of this, from because we've been talking about this for almost over a year now, but from your mouth to hopefully the people's ears who are in the middle, maybe the ones that are even far left and completely disagree with everything Trump did, but how could you convey to them, and you've been doing a really good job thus far over the last almost half an hour, but how would you convey what Trump did versus what's going on now and how it actually is better for humani- for humans, just for the humanitarian crisis, for the border security, for America in general, versus what's going on now? Well, para toda la raza, to all the to all los, los, los Latinos, los Mexicanos, los Hispanos que me están viendo, for all of you that you're watching, uh, particularly towards them, because uh, Americans, everybody describes themselves, and you should describe yourself as an American, and you're in the United States of America. Facts. That's the land that is giving you the money. That's the land that is paying your rent. That's the land that is paying your food. That's the land that is giving you all the opportunities. It's not Mexico. Forget about that. You're in you're in America. So when it comes to Donald Trump, when it first started, I, I was one of them. That it was like, this guy's crazy. This guy is out of his mind. He has a big mouth. But he's not a politician. So I started digging. As a reporter, I started digging into him. I said, what trickles this guy to put a wall? Why is he doing this? This is why I, 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 the first thing that I told you guys is that since this, when it started happening to Mexico, that all these caravans started coming into Mexico. And Mexico is a, is a country that is full of corruption. Every paisano knows that. Mexico is number one for cartel activity, number two for trafficking of children, number two for, uh, for killings of women. Number three, for trafficking of children and trafficking of humans. Number four, for clandestine bearings. It has five cities on the top five for violence and delinquents in the world right now. 60 million in poverty, 28 million in critical condition, 68 million without medical medical care. We have a lot of problems. More than 80, 93,000 murders in the first two years of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. We have all these problems. And then you got a president that stands for his country. A lot of them they don't agree with him because paisanos, you guys need to understand that when you get a guy like that that goes against all odds and against against all what the what has been pandered, they're going to attack them and flip everything up. And they're going to do everything that they can to make you believe that he's wrong, that he's a racist, that he's a fascist, that he's a narcissist. So in your mind you understand that, oh my God, this guy hates us. This guy hates Mexicans. This guy hates Latinos. This guy hates us. You know, he hates us. So you now you 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 go on one side. That's what, and I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not a right wing or a left wing, but that's how the left has worked. They treat you, come over here, you know, feel on your comfort zone. You're a minority. You are, you know, you, 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 you are, you're from, you're colored, you're brown. Come over here. We are going to understand you over here, over there, they don't. They use these kind of key words that is minority. Minority in the United States should not be existing. You're equal. Everybody's equal in that land. Everybody has the same dreams and the same, you know, obstacles in life to, to obtain everything in life. So you're not a minority. Everybody has the same right. Donald Trump came over and did that. He flipped it like that. And it made everybody understand that there's a problem at the border. Made everybody understand that draining the swamp was not only to drain the Democrats, it was to drain also the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. He made everybody look like this is the trash that I'm working with. Look at this. Before he got, uh, before he ended his term, 
every Republican that it was in the side backstabbed Donald Trump. Every Mike Pence, mm-hmm. for an example, he did a rally at Georgia with a woman that he was advocating for and get hopefully to get a vote. And the next day, that woman in Georgia was like, you know what? No, I'm voting against you. All of this, he drained a lot of stuff. And we as Latinos, we need to understand that sometimes we like, nos gusta hacer, pero nos, nos gusta que nos hagan. Mm-hmm. We like to do, but we don't like things to be done to us. We need to understand that we have a problem, and this is the only man that has addressed this problem with no pandering of, of, of language, with no, I will treat you uh, softly, with no, I will, you know, I will give you some bonus so you can understand and come and vote for me. No, he has just said it like the way it is. Zero tolerance. Def- yeah. Yeah, zero tolerance, America first. Hey, so, sorry to cut you off. Um, I'm curious La gente de Tijuana, what, what is the, I know not everybody thinks the same in Tijuana, but in Tijuana, when they see the caravans coming, what was the sentiment? How did people feel? What, what was the word on the streets? First, <clears throat> when uh, in 2015, a 15,000 came from Haiti. And we said like, wow, there's a lot of people over here. There's a lot of necessity possibly, you know, there's, let's help them out. We did not understand what was going on. Then later on, caravans started coming continuously. But we started watching how they were entering Tapachula, where I was at. They were aggressive. They were mareros. They were taking advantage of the system. They were not appreciative, some people. They were throwing our food on the floor. They said that they don't like beans. They don't like frijoles. Uh, they were taking over some houses that they were abandoned. Uh, on the way, they were throwing trash all over the place. So we started saying, like, we have a lot of problems in our country. We have a lot of poor people that they will love to have a plate of frijoles and tortillas. And these people that they have that, they're not appreciated of that. And also, there was, I've been criticized for this, but it's a reality and it's a fact. Some of the migrants that they were on the first caravan, they did not want it to work. There was a man that came from a... Uh, he has his own uh, wood and manufacturing company. And he came to the the place where the caravan was at. And he said, to all the men, mm. I'm offering a job to all of you so you can maintain your family and give food to your children. All of them said no. Mm. <laughs> said no, our goal is to the United States. You just want to take us from our family. No, no, no. I want to offer you a job. You want food? You want this? I want to offer you a job. So the perspective of Tijuanense is now with the caravans is that we have a lot of problems. We have Tijuana is number three for assassinations and killings and activity of cartel in the world. We have a lot of problems in our city. Insecurity is one of them. And to bring another problem on top of a problem and a problem and a problem, <laughs> why, we, why do we want that? Of course, we want to help, but the legal way. This is not the legal way. We got a migrant camp right here in Tijuana, that it was uh, 2,500 people migrant camp. You know, the famous Biden let us in t-shirt camp? That one, it is over here and it's still existing. And they're not moving and they don't want to move. And, you know, and and it is unbelievable where they're staying at. It's the pedestrian port of entry to the United States of America. It's federal grounds. And they've been there for more than eight to nine months. The Tijuana people, are, they are tired in a way. And not only Tijuanenses. If you go to Tapachula, the old people in Tapachula, they will tell you, the elderly, the viejos, they will tell you, we are feeling that we are being replaced. Mm. They use that word. Hmm. We're being colonized, mm. replaced. And that is a word that hurts us as Mexicans. As Mexicans, we're really proud people, you know. And to when, when you got people coming into your country, you open the door. Adelante is all yours. Do as you want. But when you are doing it in this way and our president is not doing anything about it, you feel these kind of reactions. And it is sad to see those kind of reactions from the people that they lived all their lives in that part of the city. So in a way, we feel hurt from our government that is not doing anything about it. So they feel like they're being invaded in a way? Replaced, colonized. I will say that word. Uh, you know, colonize what? 
Why? Because colonized, it means that uh, it, you're being our borders in our towns uh, remotely and slowly, they're being changed into a non-identity place. So when you get Tapachula, and Tapachula, it is part of Mexico, but when you get Tapachula and it is all migrant now, Haiti, da, la, 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 the identity of the Tapachula. Culture. It's like the it's culture. Lost. Yes, yes, it's lost. Mm. And replace is a really simple factor. You can go over there and ask uh, a, a farmer, or you can ask a, a guy that sells uh, aguas in the street, uh, you know, a guy that sells whatever, uh, you know, thing on the street. And they will tell you they get more benefits than I get. Wow. They, so I'm feeling like I'm being replaced. Why don't they don't give it to us? Why do we have to suffer? And they're, no, because they're suffering. No, they're not. They're, they're strong men. They're strong men. They can work. So this is the actual, how this globalist, you know, uh, migration, it doesn't have an order. It's not orderly done. So that's why it's affecting every country. It's almost as if Biden's open border policies and when he said surge the border, like all these announcements he would make, whether in the debates or on day one, on day one or the first 100 days, all that kind of stuff. It acted almost like a magnet calling everyone from, you know, the Haitians that were in Brazil, the Haitians that were in Chile and, and just people from all over the world, over 100 countries. What is it? The Darien Gap in, in Panama? Uh, yeah. Do you, can you get, tell us about that? Because, because like what you described in Tapachula, it's almost as if communities throughout Central America and South America are feeling, are, are feeling the firsthand effects of, of the migrants and the caravans. It's, it's, and you hit, you, hit a, you hit a good point right there, Darian Gap, but a lot of the people in the United States say, hey, why doesn't Mexico is not doing anything? Mexico is the only country that is doing something about it to stop this massive, because it's not just... 1,000, 2,000 is massive. And they're not doing a good job. They're complicit on this globalization. But also the United States of America needs to ask, who is in this globalist compact of immigration? The United States is getting hit like no other right now. It's on the sandwich of this globalist, this globalization. And it's under communistic and globalist attack. Canada signed the globalist compact of immigration and Mexico signed it. Imagine that. He's getting hit from the top and it's getting hit from the bottom. But the United States of America and Americans need to ask why Honduras is not doing anything, Guatemala, El Salvador, Bolivia, Peru, Panama, Costa, Venezuela, Colombia, Chile, Brazil. Why they're given, why they're just opening up the border? Because they don't want the problem. A lot of the migration that happens that enters to Venezuela and to Colombia, they go down south to Chile. And why they go down south to Chile, Chile has a planification a bonus planification for families. They give an, a certain amount every month for migrants between depending uh, on the family units that you have or the family members that you have. If you have two families, they will possibly give you $1,000 per month. So a lot of these people, they go down there to get an ID. This is why you see a lot of the identifications being dropped off before they enter the United States because that ID provides, provides them to transit through all the South into when they get to Mexico. In Mexico, there is the stoppage right there. You need another ID. Mm -hmm. That's why all these migrants, they're mad. Saying, hey, I got an ID in Colombia. I got an ID in Peru. And with that one, I was fascinated. Really, why you, Mexico, are giving me this? Yeah, that's a lot of money. So you're, the government of Mexico is making a lot of money out of this. The Biden administration, what did, was the most incompetent decision that I ever seen in immigration history. You go on a debate with Donald Trump and you say that there's no child trafficking. <laughs> you go on a debate and you say to the American people that you are going to create a better pathway for migrants. These are big words. When you are having an immigration problem, these are huge words. You don't just say them like that. And he said it. I'm going to create a better pathway. I'm going to help migrants. You know, there's violation of rights. Every migrant that it was waiting at the border, they were like, ah, I'm coming. This, uh, let's push that, let's push that. So he pandered to that section. He won, wrongly, rightfully, whatever it is, he's the president right now. And everybody after that, huge surge. First caravan that came, 9,000. It was stopped by the National Guard of Guatemala. 
Then after that, it was nonstop. And you go and ask all these migrants, that's the last caravan that I was walking with them. You ask them why you're coming. Biden invited me. <laughs> all of them. Yeah, all of them. Tons of videos of that. Uh, ¿Y por qué? Biden? Biden. Pues Biden. Yeah. I wonder what is it going to take for Latinos, uh, Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, um, and even just Democrats in America in general to, to rethink and reanalyze and be like, huh, hmm. It seems that what we have going on at the border is not sustainable. That's a great point. Like, right. uh, what what is it, Oscar? What is it going to take to make that mental shift for, I guess, the majority of the raza out there that just don't see it? When you <clears throat> to 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 all the, like the, the majority of the raza, they're not seeing it because they have this mentality also still that California is ours, Texas is ours. <laughs> we talk about that all the time. It was ours. It was not yours. You were not even born there. And Santana sold us out. Get facts in history. Santana sold us out to the United States. So it was not even yours. You were not even born yet. You know, I have this analogy of this man. And really quick, on dropping on that. I was talking to this old man at, in, uh, in Tapachula in Union Juarez. He owns a coffee shop. And he was telling me, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, went, I don't want to go to the United States. I felt that I was not you know, in my land. That used to be my land, California. It used to be my land. Why? Why was not received like that? And I'm like, uh, you live right here in Tapachula all your life. Yes, I live right here in Chiapas all my life. Chiapas was from Guatemala. Mm, got him. <laughs> they got annexed. Then later on was from Mexico. So the mentality that you are, you're telling me right now is exactly the same as Guatemaltecos feel about you. Mm. You were not even born there yet. That's the that's the thing that with the, people need to understand that when this all of this massive way that is coming to your borders, when you see in all these cartel activity that is happening in our borders, and now you understand how the massive power that cartel and the organized crime has right now and the impact on the United States of America. Now you it's it's, it's unbelievable that everything is coming out. You see agents that they're letting them buy. You see, you know, politicians that they're for open borders. Why? This is this is changing. The United States, uh, uh, Mexicanos, Hispanos, Mexican Americans, and Americans, they're going to realize that they made a mistake when you start becoming third world. Mm. When your economy starts falling, when you are not providing like you used to, when you're you're not the United States of America anymore. When you don't, they're taking away your freedom. Mexico right now has more freedom of speech than the United States of America. Mexico right now has the freedom of speech of saying whatever the hell we want and you don't. They will shut you down. Can you please expand on that? Well, Mexico right now, if I go to a restaurant, if I travel in my country, example, I just did it. If I travel in my country, there's no mandate for me. If you travel in your country, you need a mandate. Mexico right now, if I go to a restaurant, I just, as a protocol, I just wear it, the diaper, and then I go and sit down. <laughs> In the United States, no. You have regulations now to tell you what and what not to do. Also, in the United States <clears throat> of America, they're under, they don't know. These people, they don't know. They're running away. A lot of these migrants are running away from communist attacks. Communists and in, 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 in socialism. Mm -hmm. If you talk to ben, the Venezuela migrants, that which I'm going to uh, put up an interview that I did a special on some family that was migrating to Venezuela and went to the Darien Gap. The Darien Gap is the most horrible place for migrants and next to the Mediterranean Sea that connects to Italy also, that that is another horrible place that a lot of people have died on the sea. The Darien Gap is owned by indigenous tribes, and also by the Cartel La Farc. As migrants arrive, they're currency. They're not people. They're currency. You got people with long shotguns, uh, you know, telling you where to go. And also you got people wearing a, uh, a uh, barcode with the uh, Western Union code on the bottom. Shirts. You arrive and say, there's the barcode. There's the Western Union account. You deposit, I will lead you. 
The Darien Gap is one of the most horrible places that you can ask a migrant how it is. This family, and I saw, and I asked so many, a Nigerian, uh, and also a West African, uh, a lot of the people that I asked about Darien Gap, but this family itself, they saw uh, body after body after body as they were walking through the, to, through the jungle, dead bodies all around the way. They were covering their child's eyes every time that they saw a body and another body. Hmm. And, cu- and counting, one of them, he told me, I saw 20 of them in one particular part. The other one told me, I saw 40 of them going up the hill. The most horrible thing that they experienced was this family uh, was three men, uh, two women. One of them uh, was you know, married to one of them. And his woman was pregnant two months old. As they were walking through the jungle, they got stopped by the indigenous tribe, put guns in their head. And one of them said, I will rape your woman in front of your eyes just to make you understand that you are going to pay to cross here. I don't have no money. What can I do for you to not rape her? That's the only solution for you. So they raped her woman in Mm. front of his eyes. The woman lost her child Mm. because of that. They continue their pathway. As they were continuing their pathway going up the hill, they encounter a little another group of migrants. And that group was a 17-year-old Cuban. By the way, the day describing her was really beautiful 17-year-old uh, woman, minor. And they say that 17 men raped her in front of everybody. They took advantage of her rape her, left her unconscious, waited for her to receive consciousness again. The most dramatic thing, Chino Bling, that happened was as they were going up the hill, you know, being escorted by these horrible people. She went up the hill, and after she got up at the hill, she committed suicide. Oh my God. She jumped the hill and died <sighs> as she landed on the rocks. These are experiences that also you see how when you're listening to these people, the Nigerian, he said that they were migrating with his best friend of his childhood. And at a place there was a landslide, his friend could could not hold, and he saw his friend die in front of his eyes with other 20 people that they went to the river, drowning. These kind of things that that you're hearing from when they're giving you a statement, you immediately look to the North and you look to the president of the United States of America and say, I will give a better pathway for migrants. I will let in 125,000 per year. Come, the children, I will help you. You're provoking this to continue and you're provoking and you're feeding the organized crime to continue. They know that they're coming because the United States of America, it is opening the doors for these people to create money and funnel money. Every, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, s- sorry, but uh, everybody that's still in favor of open borders and still think that Kamala and Brandon are doing a good job with the border and and, you know, they feel good because they, you know, they have a, a warm heart for immigrants. They don't realize they don't know these stories like our voices, you know, on Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm shadow banned. They, they're not uplifting my brown voice. You right. know, they just don't like what my brown voice has to say. But unfortunately, you know, the common American, they're busy dealing with inflation and the gas price and the cost of goods and, and all these other things. You know, is the dollar going to sustain what's up with our free speech? And they have no idea the amount of like, you know, peril these people are being put in. Human trafficking, uh, you're empowering cartels. Uh, human slavery is alive and well in America. A lot of these people are going to have to work off this debt. A lot of the women are going to have to work off the debt a different way. Uh, God forbid we know what happens to these to these children. Um, so earlier you mentioned a lot of these people are escaping socialism and communism. Um, dude, there's people that I know that I work with that I care about. They went to college and they're, you know, they're educated. So they're under the impression that communism is good. Socialism is a good thing. Chingo. Hey, man, what are you talking about, Mr. Capitalism? You know what I mean? Like, 
it's just such a shit show. Everything you're describing, bro, all these like anecdotes and specific stories and, you know, the dangers. But, you know, Mr. Brandon, todo mundo, like, at least he's not mean tweets. Yeah. Chinga la madre. No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> when you have these people describing communism, I have always, you know, uh, you, in, in, in Venezuela, they make $3 a month. Uh, in Cuba, they made $27 a month. Look what is happening right now to Belarus and Alexander Lukashenko, what is provoking to Poland. Oh, can, can, can you, can you, I've, I've been hearing about the Polish uh, immigration <clears throat> situation. Can you uh, expand on that? What's going on in Poland? Belarus has an enormous socialistic dictatorship. Uh, Alexander Lukashenko has been the president for Belarus for more than 26 years. Uh, the last year was the year that he got reelected. Uh, and they say that they stole the election. As every communistic and socialistic country, they shut down the electricity, they shut down computers, and all of a sudden he's Sounds up familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's the same strategy. It happened, you know, what happened to the United States of America, a lot of people don't understand this, but it's the strategy that the communists use. Uh, in Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro used it against, uh, uh, I, I forgot his name, but uh, against... Was it uh, Aguayo or something? What yes. Okay. Yeah. The opposition, he used it. And Juan Orlando Hernandez in Honduras, he used it also. Evo Morales in Bolivia, he used it. Uh, and he was 12 years of dictatorship. In Ecuador, also, they used it. In Nicaragua, they used it. Uh, they have been using this strategy for the longest of time. And Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, he knew that he was going to get a lot of backfire. So as soon as he won, there was a lot of protests in his country, a lot of protests from young kids that they don't want socialism and communism. That was not out there because mainstream media does not want to put out a dictator being exposed. So Vladimir Putin, Alexander Lukashenko, asked help from Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin sent his troops to Belarus and he controlled the situation. Now, Belarus has always acted as a country that is always being uh, you know, punished and suffered by tariffs and also by you know, tax and not being helped by capitalist countries. So the government of Poland uh, right now released a statement that this massive of influx of migrants, not only from Belarus, but there are migrants from the Middle East, there are migrants from all across the world that they are trying to rush uh, the border of Poland. Mm -hmm. And Poland has said right now that they're gonna put a wall to protect themselves from this enormous influx. Also, they are preparing to not be rushed the border and they are they sent a statement that they are a sovereign nation mm -hmm. there's laws to migrate and there's a way to migrate exactly the same happened in 2020 with morocco try to rush the border in spain exactly the same thing happened president of, of spain pedro sanchez i believe that his name he went over there and he sent the military all the way to the border of Spain with Morocco and controlled the mass migration. A lot of people don't understand this is a strategy. This mm -hmm. is a political state, yes. what they do. It's exactly what Irineo Mujica, the leader right now of the caravan, did on 2018 to the United States of America. It's a political statement to say, I'm coming. This is what is happening. Put attention to me. Release funds. I need it. I want it. Put attention to this mass migration. It is a political statement. After this, you're going to see a lot of things, Chingo, that is going to happen. They're going to have a lot of help from Belarus. They're going to send, you know, help for the migrants. And they're going to funnel a lot of money. And they're going to, all these, you know, NGOs, they're going to go over there and try to protect and help, aid and evade. And like, wait, we don't have money. You know, we need money for you to help me to control this mass migration. So that's the situation right there but it's it's inevitably it's going to get control because it's they're not going to let that happen the migrants are being weaponized it happened in germany with uh, Ang angela merkel um where she was the brandon the globalist of that of that of the of the eu and same thing it it totally affected germany's politics economy it changed so mm -hmm. much so it, it's it's being weaponized you know what i mean mm -hmm. if they're trickling in but you know it's a little different this is a is a visual it's a political statement like you said mm -hmm. and um you know they have certain certain goals that they're trying to trying to get out of it i saw some footage i think jack posobic posted footage because he's polish um descent of uh the poland border Nombre parece una, like una cerca. It's like a little bitty fence, maybe with a little bit of mm -hmm. a barbed wire. And I, I guess the people from Belarus were 
getting logs, chopping down trees to to like smush the, the fence, fence and to use it almost like a bridge. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's a confrontation happening right now. Wow. You know, people don't understand this, but it's getting to a point that really it's, 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 it's really logical for us to understand. And they look at us as Hispanics. They look at us like you don't understand. We understand what is going on and what is happening. People need to understand that this is not the Americans' fault. This is not the Mexicans' fault. This is not the citizens' fault. This is the fault of the of the globalist elite and socialist communist dictators and people in power that they have. The United States of America has been a great provider of money for around the world. They have given a lot of money, but they have made the mistake to give the money to the wrong people. And when you're giving away $100 million, it's not the fault of the citizens. It's the fault of the, of the head chief give away a hundred million dollars and you give it to Juan Orlando Hernandez, Juan Orlando Hernandez is going to, the president of Honduras is going to spend one million and he's just going to keep the 99 million to him. And it is exactly what has been happening all around the world. You create a catastrophe, you create a clash of economy, you create poverty, you create a third world class country. This is why these people, they don't understand. They say, oh, the American imperialism, but why don't you don't talk about the Chinese imperialism? Why don't you talk about the, the first-class world countries imperialism? Where are these first-class world countries helping the United States of America right now? Saying, oh, we're helping Europe. The United States is also helping Europe. I talked to a, a journalist from the UK as we were walking in the Caribbean, and he was telling me, oh, you know, these policies from Donald Trump and now the policies of Biden exactly the same. I'm like, wait, hold on a minute. Nancy. What is you, the UK doing to help this catastrophe? Oh, we're helping Europe. Well, I don't see Germany coming over here. Australia, New Zealand, France, Italy, Spain, nobody is providing and aiding and abating to stop this catastrophe. These countries and all these people from Central and South America, they will not move and they will not, these people will not get away from their country if they had a good life or if they had a sustainable life. Their life in general over there, it is bad. Yes, it is bad. It is poverty and it is exacerbated to the catastrophes of economy. So you push these people out and you create a catastrophe of a migration because it's poor. You don't have nothing to sustain your family. You got violence. You create this, this, you know, this enormous, you know, huge of, of problematics on every country. So you don't stop that. You let it flow. You create a third world from a third world from a third world from a third world. So every country almost looks the same. And the only one that is different is the United States. So what they're trying to do to the United States right now, people need to understand that it's not the people. It is the system, how they're trying to make it look. Honduras is the same. Guatemala is the same. Nicaragua is the same. Let's make Mexico the same. And then, brah, you got the borders, and it looks exactly the same as Mexico. It looks exactly the same. You know, the river, when they were going back in the Rio, it's exactly what is happening in Tapachula. You go to Guatemala, you come back and forth on a water raft. And it is exactly what is happening in, in the United States. So people need to understand that. Me meanwhile, our leaders are like, we're going to get to the root causes. And, you know, it's climate. Climate change is racist. Climate is racist. It's, it's because they're escaping climate, people. We need to we need to give money to the Northern Triangle countries. We need to give them more money. We need to stop being mean like Donald Trump with the zero tolerance crap. Dude, it's going to be real hard not to shoot people that are dancing around saying this is stolen uh, stolen land with like a net gun. You know, they're just dancing around in America like you're on stolen land. Just hit them with one of the... Net guns. But let me ask you this, Oscar. Do you have any insight on, on what's going on in El Salvador ever since their new leader took over and started changing things up? <sighs> Nayib Bukele has been a complete, you know, change to El Salvador. And even I have an interview with one migrant that has wombs on his feet. And he was laying down at a church. I don't remember the town. I think it was Wixla, the town where they were uh, uh, sitting down. And I went over there and it was uh, out of curiosity because he had a lot of wounds on his feet up mm. walking. I was like, hey, you're OK? And he's like, yes, I'm OK. Uh, where are you from? And he said, from El Salvador. And I said, uh, how's Nayib Bukele treating you? And he said, he's doing great. So like, what are you doing here? He's, well, the United States has a better opportunity for me to. I'm old. I'm 40 plus. So I want to get, you know, fast going on my life and, you know, to stay in El Salvador is going to be a long term mm. for me to get a better life. But what is happening in El Salvador, you don't see a lot of El Salvadorians, El Salvadoreños uh, migrating now. And it is because Nayib Bukele has changed a little bit of what it was. And he's fighting off the gang violence. That is the number one thing that is kind of like El Cartel. 
The first thing that Nayib Bukele did for his country was, I will send the National Guard all around our country, outside of our borders, to protect our country from these gang members from getting out, the MS-13s. Because, you know, he's a realistic, uh, you know, president and he's young. So he said, everybody's accusing me that I'm the MS-13 country and that I'm the MS, you know, Mara Salvatrucha country that is exploding and that is exporting all of this. So I will stop it. I will put the National Guard all around it. Also, he has created a better economy. They, the United States had a really good opportunity with him. The Biden administration ruined that. Hmm. On the 6th of January of 2020, uh, Nayib Bukele went all the way to the White House. He traveled all the way to the White House. Uh, the people in the administration of Biden knew that he was going to go to the White House. And when he arrived, guess who received him? Nobody. Mm. Uh, he was standing right there alone. Uh, he was waiting for somebody to greet him, some secretary, some assistant. Nobody greeted him. Uh, he wanted to do business with the United States of America. He said, "I want to be. I don't want to be a burden on the United States. I want to. I want to create a relationship. I want. We want trade. We don't want aid. We want trade. We want to be a first class world country. Let's work. Send your capitalist, you know, uh, businesses, and you know, I will. I will return. You know, uh, he has this idea of the money that is being sent from El Salvadorians to El Salvador. That is a bad idea. He says that it's a vicious cycle, and he's right." If you're sending all this money from the United States from El Salvadoreños all the way to El Salvador, you're thinking that you're helping, but no, you're part of the problem. You're creating a cycle that the economy is never going to get better, and you're just making people flee to go to the United States to do exactly the same thing. So he says we need to stop that, and we need to create our economy better, our, our security better. So when he went over there to the White House, nobody received him. So he had to rent a lobby to go and do his press conference alone. And then he decided the United States is not listening to me. Wow. The United States does not want to help me. I need a first class world country to help me because I want to su succeed. Sadly, he took the decision to negotiate with China mm -hmm. because only one that is going to help uh, the economy to sustain ourselves in trade. Ain't that some shit? Yeah, the United States lost a big big le young leader an opportunity even he went on tucker carlson on an interview with tucker carlson and Nayib Bukele explained to tucker carlson i know that the problems is mine i know that we have the, the the reason why people are leaving is because of our country is bad but i don't want to be that country anymore i want to trade and tucker carlson was agreeing with him oh you know you, you sound pretty you know smart on what do you want to do you want to put your country first so he said yeah but nobody's listening to me in the united states so i had to find another route for for my country to get better all the all the things that he was wanting to get accomplished that would have been music to the trump administration's ears yeah it would have been like wait you want to be on your own feet sustainable you want to trade we help you you help us you help eliminate some of the some of our grievances and some of the friction and everything and because i think at one point uh como se dice bukele how you say his bukele. name see si, bukele, bukele yes. um i think at one point he said el salvador's greatest export import or something is basically salvadoreños que viven acá that are just sending back kickback to to the family mm -hmm. uh huge loss of opportunity i mean the brandon administration is literally dropping the ball it's almost as if they say you know what kid you're just a northern triangle like right it's almost like they worry more about optics like they don't jump on things until the news starts to be like whoa ho, inflation's yeah. getting pretty bad or like we can no longer hide what's happening at the border and then they start to play this three card monty uh, shell game they start moving the kids around they they move they shush the cameras away from the bridges they they bust the haitians everywhere else and then it's like and we fixed it well they're too busy making the united states a police state when you have the cia when you have the fbi that are doing things like going after somebody for a diary but not things like tax trump tax trump's tax returns or you know the the, the one six riot it's like okay we're starting to let's start from the inside out make this a police state and then fuck it no one can do anything last night i saw episode one of the patriot purge it's a tucker carlson documentary on fox nation and uh if you guys get a chance check it out because they literally sy systematically show in the media with the editing showing like 
the same way they did with 9-11. They were like, uh, Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, Iraq, Osama, Saddam, same thing. You know, Al-Qaeda, okay, Iraq, okay, weapons of mass destruction. And now what they're doing is... They're like, January 6th, it's worse than 9-11. January 6th, it's the new 9-11. January 6th, 9-11. Domestic terrorists, 9-11. January 6th. And it's like, and now we're going after the citizens. Yeah. Patriot yeah. Purge. Está cabrón, güey. De repente me miras en Tijuana. <laughs> God damn. So, Oscar, how, what, so as we're coming up on the hour here, what can you tell our listeners and people that maybe want to try to open their ears a little bit, see what you have to say, what can we do to make sure that in the future this goes in a different direction, in a more positive direction for the American citizen? Uh, if anything, I know that's a tough question, yeah. but you know what I mean, just like in general. The United States of America, in a lot of our eyes, is the best country in the land of opportunity. And they're trying to take away that from you and it is the number one reason why everybody wants to go to that country is the difference they did an experiment with the united states of america they said we're not going to implement a system we're going to implement freedom and they implemented that in the united states of america and it worked and it is the greatest country or it was the greatest country that exists in the world but for us that we remember the united states of or what it was we consider it the door to the most closest door to, you know, the best country that exists. If you were born in the United States, you were born in the cradle of gold. It's yes, you were born to work. You can give yourself an opportunity to become the best that you can be and to dream and to be a leader of the world or to, you know, from one thing you can create a business from one day you can be a, you know, picking up trash and the other day you can be, you know, have your own, you know, your better life with your own family. The United States is that. And they're trying to take away that from you. And if they take, they're trying to take away that from you, it's because they were trying to make you equal to everybody else the same. The most important thing is you understand that they're trying to take away your freedom. It is happening in schools. It is happening in your house. It is happening in every part of your country. Remember what Abraham Lincoln said. Abraham Lincoln said this, the United States will be destroyed, not by outsiders, but by within. And he was right. The United States of America has their own enemies. The cancer of the United States of America is between their own leftist politicians and communist and globalist politicians. They're the ones that are taking away your freedom. They're the ones that they're indoctrinating your children. They're the ones that they're bringing all these godless ideas to schools. It's not outsiders. It's what is happening inside of your country. So right now, it is the most important time for this new generation to understand the liberalism it is not the solution for freedom. When you stand on this side of Mexico and you're looking at another first class world country and you're gonna say, I want that. And I will tell you, you were that. And you will be exactly like me, sitting down in a chair and acknowledging that one day we will become a first class world country. But I will look at you and I'll say, you had it and you lost it. Mm. So it is really important that right now, every single one of you understands what you have and understands what you can lose and if you want to lose it continue with all these radical organizations black lives matter antifa all these people that are bringing division and they're just ruining your communities continue with supporting ilhan omar rashida talib alexander ocasio and lancy pelosi continue with that continue one day you will be on this side Sadly, it will be sitting down and acknowledging another first class world country. You will say, I want that, but you're not going to have it because they took it away from you. So the first thing that you need to do is fight for your freedom. That's the number one thing. She makes me want to run through a wall. That's going to have to be the ending of the show right there. Yeah, bro. it is, man. I'm going to make that its own clip, the very first clip I put out for sure. Drop that was mic. excellent, man. Can you tell, everyone, tell everyone where to find you, uh, all your you know, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram, a website? Well, first of all, uh, Chingo, and to your uh, producer, thanks so much for the invitation. You guys are you guys are doing uh, a really good work. The most important thing is that your voices are being heard, and that you don't stop. Don't let nobody stop you. If they want to stop you, it means that you're doing something, something really good. So don't let nobody stop. You. So thank you so much for your invitation. First and foremost, to all your audience, uh, you can follow me as Oscar Blue, Facebook, Telegram, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. 
my channel YouTube, Oscar L. Blue. Uh, in Instagram, I'm an Oscar Blue Media. Instagram has been doing some awful work. They have been taking away. I have an Instagram account that has not even a thousand followers, Jingo, and they take it away. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't go there in, in Instagram that much. But uh, you can follow me in, uh, in, in Instagram like that. Real America's Voice News. I'm always there uh, with Mr. Steve Bannon in the war room and also uh, with Dr. Gina and all those people. So you can follow me over there in Real America's Voice News. So those are my platforms. Uh, thank you so much again for inviting me. Hey, me saludas al Steve Bannon, por favor. Mira, la otra, a la otra, hey, compadre, este, mi amigo Chingo Blin quiere que le firmes aquí la gorra, por favor. Fírmele la bota, por favor, Mr. Steve Bannon. Hey, I'll tell you something. A lot of people uh, 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 tell me, oh, he's an extremist. He's a radical right winger. He's a really nice man. He, and he's racist. He's always behind the scenes. A lot of people don't know what happens, but behind the scenes, he's like, Blue, how you're doing? How's everything going over there? Take care of yourself. He's a really good man, and he respects everybody. The only thing that he respects is his law and order. He wants everything to be done correctly, mm-hmm. not violate the laws and not cheat on the laws of the United States. So he stands for that. So that's why, you know, the left, they, they mm-hmm. exaggerate with him. Yeah. But he's I- a Yeah, I used to believe those fake narratives, too. Uh, They try to find the worst picture of them. They try to paint a false narrative. But really, he's just a populist, economic nationalist. He's down to tax the rich. He's just for the people. So, Oscar, thank you so much, man. We'll be in touch. Uh, Get some rest, because I know you're you're in between assignments. Uh, Thank you so much for making time, and uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Thanks, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Have a great day.